So good uh, middle of the morning. And before we start the session, has anybody of you lost a cellular phone yesterday? But one was found in the toilets. Huh? <laughs> not inside the toilet. <laughs> because this, this would not work anymore. I hope so. <laughs> would not be interesting <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay, so it seems that all of you have your phones. Uh, so let's start the, the section on uh, detector. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to have this here that will uh, tell us about uh, a detector for the LC. Is the remote working? Yes. And the pointer as well, okay. Ah, yes. Okay, so back to good old hardware, which is good. <laughs> okay, right, so I'll talk a little bit about um, work which has been ongoing in the context of the ILC for detectors and uh, related issues. Uh, let me remind you a little bit what the ILC is, and I um, mean, you know, all of you will know it, but maybe point out a few things which are different or similar to, to the FCCE, which you're discussing here. ILC, of course, and that's the biggest difference, is linear. So it's a linear collider designed for collisions, E plus E minus collisions at 500 GeV, and uh, if you find the money, upgradable to 1 TeV. Um, it is based on superconducting technology, which means, uh, which implies to some extent that it will be operated in a pulsed operation, so it will have a particular time structure whereby you do have bunches following reasonably close to each other, but they're in a train with a long pause in between. And roughly speaking, there are bunches every few hundred nanoseconds, and the interbunch spacing is uh, macroscopic, so it is running at 5 or 10 hertz. Um, bunch train repetition frequency. And this, of course, has implications on how you handle events and how you handle, in particular, also powering of your detectors. Um, since a linear collider, you don't have the privilege of being able to reuse your beams, and you have to really um, push on the beam parameters to obtain the luminosity you want. And the way which was chosen for ILC is that uh, to obtain a, a luminosity in the range of 10 to 34, you have highly focused flat beams, which uh, has one consequence, and it was alluded to here also earlier for the FCC, that um, the beams are so strongly focused that they start to interact with, with each other, and you have a phenomenon which is called beam strahlung, which again has an impact on the design of the detector, and I'll comment on this later on. Um, overall, and, and I'm not going to say much more about the design of a machine, but I presume in any case that you're more or less familiar with that. Um, a strong point of the ILC, I think, is that it's a fairly mature design. We have been discussing this for quite a number of years now. And in particular, a DAISY we are building, which from our point of view is actually a prototype for the ILC, uh, namely the XFAL, the European Free Electron Laser, which is based on the same technology as the ILC. So many of the concepts, many of the problems, eventually an ILC, a superconducting ILC would face, um, are being addressed and are being looked at in the context of this project, which I think is extremely useful if you want to plan and if you want to understand really uh, the machine as it is. I should point out that the numbers which we are discussing in the context of the ILC are the outcome of a very long and intense discussion among the accelerator scientists and the detector scientists and the physicists. Um, and they are by now what I would call reasonably conservative. So we have not tried to optimize the machine on the actual peak performance, but rather on a sort of safe performance where you are not pushing any of the parameters to its absolute um, most ambitious uh, value. So in that sense, it is somewhat conservative and something which is also quite important to keep in mind. It is a design which is, in a sense, power driven. So if we have designed to reach a certain overall AC power consumption of the site, um, which is for a 500 machine, 500 GV machine, something like 150, 160 megawatts. Um, of course, if you're willing to pay more in operations and put more power on the site, you of course can scale up your luminosity um, with power, basically. Um, 
I'll only very briefly comment on the science because that's not the main, main purpose here. Um, there is, of course, and this was also discussed in the concept of FCC, a very concise and comprehensive program on Higgs physics, which spans a complete energy range ILC will hopefully be able to offer throughout its lifetimes, starting at something like, um, well, ideally even on the Z, but uh, maybe starting at uh, 160, 250 GeV, and then going up to eventually one TeV, and you could then, as you can see, you will be able to cover at the LC really all aspects in this particular instance of Higgs physics, uh, which you can think of with reasonable precision, even if you find some means to actually, or the money to go to one TeV, you will even start to get access to the six self coupling, which I think is an extremely difficult and ambitious analysis, but this probably is the only way you will actually be able to do a significant measurement of the Higgs self coupling um, if you can go to energies, something like one TeV or so, ne plus e minus. Of course, we all know there's physics beyond the Higgs and just a few plots here um, on what you potentially can do, supersymmetry, a dark matter, precision measurements of MVM top. I think that is all quite well known to you and um, I think obvious. Now, experimentation at the RLC, and again, I think the, the main driving forces here are extremely similar to what you've been discussing in the context of FCCEE. Of course, the strength of an E plus E minus machine is precision. And so if you design a detector for such a machine, you really are designing a detector for precision physics, and you have to keep this in mind from day one. So you want um, precision measurements of vertexing, of, of tracking, of colorimetry. You'd like to, like to really understand the properties of your complete final state you're observing, uh, be it leptonic, be it hadronic. So you are pushing on precision in any of these uh, quantities. You have to have hermeticity, so you really have to think how to avoid cracks, how to build a complete coverage for the detector, and how to also go down as low as possible in, in coverage towards the beam pipe. And of course, you also want to be inclusive. You don't want to lose anything. So the design of the ILC calls for a detector, which essentially has no hardware trigger, just sort of flat out recording everything you ever see, and then later on, offline, you try to separate out the interesting events. Um, this then implies certain things which you have to have. Continuous tracking, you'd like to be able to really see everything without any dead time. You want a calorimeter, which uh, some people call an imaging calorimeter, which can really dis disentangle the individual particles in your final state, also in the shower. You want ultra low mass, because only then can you get excellent tracking, excellent vertexing, and also actually avoid flooding your calorimeter with conversions, uh, with conversions and other things. And you want low power, because only if you have low power in your detector will you be able to achieve low mass, else you have to pipe in so much electricity, so much copper, that uh, it's a no-go from, from the very beginning. So altogether, this then means you have to have a real challenge in, in designing a detector, an integrated detector, and I think that's also one, one thing, one lesson we learned that really the detector, the detector concept you're looking at is more than the, than the sum of its parts. You have to keep this overall picture in mind when you try to come up with your detector concept. And at the ILC, there are two detector concepts which have been developed, SID and ILD, which are similar and different, similar in that they are designed under the same um, assumptions, different in that they take somewhat different approaches to reach the goals. And given that this is a linear collider, we don't have the uh, privilege of being able to serve more than one interaction point without losing luminosity. We have to have a scheme to be able to serve more than one detector. And the scheme which was chosen for the ILC is what's called push-pull, that is a system by which we can exchange the detectors reasonably rapidly in the beamline um, to be able to actually serve two detectors without losing too much luminosity. But of course, compared to linear collider, you don't gain in, in the sense that you can duplicate or, or double your luminosity by having two detectors. You simply share the, the luminosity <coughs> and hopefully you gain by having different systematics, different problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Push-pull is something which also has implications on detector design, and I will not design this, uh, discuss this in any great detail. Um, but technically, I think we have convinced ourselves that it is a feasible option. If, in the end, one does it or not, probably is to a large extent a matter of money and budget. Uh, let me just comment briefly on 
these, uh, what I mentioned initially, these um, specific RC conditions. To obtain the luminosity we want at the linear collider, we have, we, we have gone for a solution where the beams at the IP are very, very flat. So they are very different in, uh, in the two dimensions, 500 nanometer in the one dimension, <coughs> 4 to 5 nanometer in the other dimension. And this is to optimize luminosity on the one hand side and minimize this so-called beam strahling on the other hand side. Beam strahling is an effect whereby if two highly focused bunches pass through each other, they start to see effects from interacting with each other, and this results in a very strong creation of photons, essentially, from the IP, uh, photon radiation. So it's a little cartoon here which shows you how, what, what this does. And basically what it does is on the one hand side, of course, it creates lots of photons. On the other hand, it also blows up your beams. So after the interaction, beams basically are much larger and uh, very difficult to handle. <clears throat> now the consequence of this beam strahlung is all these photons, they're very much forward going. So the, by far, most of them just disappear down the beam pipe. Um, and eventually, a couple of hundred meters down, downstream, we'll have to worry about absorbing them. But for the detector, only the tails are of importance. There are very few which go to large angles. But even those do create significant number of hits in the detector, just because the total numbers are so large. And that's a picture here of um, what it looks like in our case with TPC, where you see in TTBI event, those are the blue tracks and then superimposed hits you get from beam strahlung on the TPC. And again, I'll comment on this later on a little bit. So For this particular picture, yeah. this was integrated over, I think, 100 bunch crossings, which is roughly what the TPC would be integrating okay. over. It's a third of a train. So the concept I'll be discussing most is a LD detector. Um, it's an um, integrated detector, which is large, international large detector, larger than the SID. Um, it has a large magnetic volume. So the main feature is that you have a coil, which you see here. It's, by the way, pretty much the same as for CMS in terms of field and in terms of size. Um, so it's something which we know we can build. And then inside that coil, we have essentially the main parts of the detector. That is a complete calorimeters and the tracking system. Uh, what you see here is one end cap removed, so of course this will not be open but will be closed and you'll see it on the, on the back side. Um, ILD for the tracking system is based on a combination of silicon and gaseous tracking, time projection chamber, and the calorimetry is driven very much by the particle flow paradigm. It's an international group, participation from some 60 or so groups. Um, which have signed up to it with strong contributions from Europe and Japan, some from the United States, and that is an unreadable distribution of the, of the countries which are participating in ILD. And um, overall, if I take ILD and SLD together, this is the distribution of, of countries participating in the detector effort for the ILC. So you see it's a fairly broad international effort, uh, nicely distributed across the three regions of the world. Now let me quickly go through the different uh, parts of the detector and just point out some features and, uh, and challenges, starting with the inner detector. To some extent, of course, it is very typical. So you start, okay, first of all, you are roughly here you see the sizes we are talking about. So you have a detector which has a radius of something like eight meters length, including the yoke of, of six or seven meters. Um, here is the final focusing magnet of the machine the one which we were also discussing for FCC earlier. And at the moment, this is roughly at 4, 4 meter 50 away from the IP. And the uh, discussion is ongoing also on how to optimize this position. Uh, if, we, if we zoom in to the, to the central region, that is what, what, what it is. So we have here the IP in this corner. You have the electromagnetic calorimeter, the hydronic calorimeter, the coil, would be, the coil would be outside here. Then you have a large volume TPC supplemented by silicon tracking on the inside and also a layer on the outside. And of course, for the forward direction, a system of tracking disks, which ensures that as you lose acceptance in your TPC, you pick up acceptance in silicon and really try to cover down to a reasonably low angles. Uh, in terms of number of hits participating into a track, that's a plot you see here, where here you see the number of TPC hits, here you see the number of silicon hits, and you see that we always, down to very low angles, 
have silicon hit coverage, which is roughly five or so, better than five for most part, and of course in the central barrel, more than 200 hits from a TPC. So the reason why we chose a TPC is that uh, it is <coughs> the TPC is still very attractive because it does offer you a large number of points, 200 points, though at a somewhat, um, I wouldn't say limited, but uh, at, a, at a somewhat lesser accuracy than silicon, still is a very powerful tool for pattern recognition and for overall event reconstruction, and then combined with silicon can really then reach the anticipated resolution we would need. And it's also a very attractive means to reach something which has a very low material budget. You can instrument a large volume with very low material, uh, at least in the, uh, in, the, um, in the central region. Now for the vertex detector, and here the, um, okay, the layout got a little bit screwed up, doesn't matter. For the vertex detector, we're looking at a number of different technologies uh, and by no means decided which to use. But maybe what's interesting is to just compare the requirements of the vertex detector to those of the LHC. And the biggest difference really is, I think, in this number here, which is the radiation exposure of the detector, which uh, is completely uncritical for the ILC. It's 10 to the 10 neutron equivalents, which is what you could quite easily reach with existing technologies. So really, background, what is what's driving the technology choice at the LHC, is not an issue for the ILC. It's other issues which count and which are, which are much more important. Um, also, in terms of readout speed, it is more relaxed. So again, you can really utilize these more relaxed conditions to push precision and, uh, and, and try to really get the most out of your detector. These two plots summarize a little bit the anticipated performance here, the IP resolution we would like to obtain as a function of the momentum, and you see we are going to something like a few times 10 to the minus 3 um, in the sort of large momentum range, which is quite good, and which we can achieve because we can push the inner radius of the detectors down to something like 1.5 centimeters or so. In terms of flavor tag performance, uh, this detector would do very well. Here you see the efficiency and purity curve for a B tag and for a charm tag, and this curve here is if you would look at a charm tag and only look at the B background, uh, and you see that even for charm, I mean, B is always easy. Everybody can do B. Uh, we do get pretty good numbers, but the tough part is charm, of course. We all know that. And you see that we get there, even for charm, quite good efficiency purity numbers, um, which really allows us to also study things like Higgs to CC bar and others with, with reasonable accuracy. Um, the Current design of the vertex detector calls for a three-layer layout, and each layer actually is, is a double layer, uh, some millimeter or so apart. This is powerful. So that's a blow-up, so you have two layers. That gives you a handle on, in, in two ways. One is it allows you um, to maybe share the, 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 what, what, what you want to measure a little bit between the two layers. You can optimize one layer for spatial accuracy and the other layer for timing accuracy. Um, since if you look at a, it's a pixelated detector, of course, if, you are, if you're looking at very fine pixels, obviously you run, run into trouble with readout speed and other things. And so you can try to then distribute this a little bit between the two layers. And the other very important part is that this does give you a local measurement of the direction of your track, sort of mini tracks. And as I'll show you in a minute, this really does help you in the reconstruction, for example, of low, low momentum particles and, and reaching high uh, precision for those. Now I did discuss initially a little bit the beam strahlung, and I showed you this picture already um, about the background in the TPC, which is looking at this, looks quite severe, but actually this is also then where the power of the TPC comes into play, and because you have so many points, you can then quite easily run some simple algorithms to try to reduce the background by looking for mini curlers and others, and if you apply this algorithm you clean up your event drastically. And you see that uh, quite easily, you can really get rid of most of the background in your tracking volume and um, then concentrate on, pet on track finding and pattern recognition, um, <coughs> which is, of course, what you want to do. And this is then. This, this background is mainly, like, it's not tracked, right? It's, it's, it's essentially points uh, that photons. Yeah, it's, it's, it's photons, some electrons. There are some electrons in there as well. Can you speak 
Okay, these are these, these are photons or electrons which which then produce low energy or cl little clusters in the, in the in the in the TPC, and because of the magnetic field, they then spiral along the field lines. Ah, okay. uh, and uh, and uh, so the, the, length, the correlation of length is really just a spiral. Right, 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 right. Thank you. So because of the high field you have for in our case three and a half Tesla field, they spiral along the beam pipe yeah. uh, along the electric field and uh, magnetic. <laughs> Those are mostly photons from, from, from beam strahlung, which then do uh, just conversions, electrons, right. And of course, you have a similar problem in the, in the, in the silicon tracker. Um, and as you can see, you can clean this up quite, quite nicely in, in, in a TPC, which I think one, one of the powerful things you can do in a, in a large volume detector. Now, in terms of resolution, what's been achieved you see here for a prototype of a TPC as a function of drift length in millimeter, and you'll see that this is 100 micron line um, for, um, <coughs> well, this is actually at, at one Tesla field, so that, of course, for the final system would go down significantly, but uh, uh, based on these numbers, we can claim that for the TPC, we can reach a point resolution over the complete drift length less than 100 micron um, in the con complete volume if and that's, of course, a big if, if we can control the systematics connected to magnetic field, et cetera, um, well enough. That is a material budget we can reach in the detector um, as a function of theta. You see here, of course, for TPC, you need an end plane, a readout end plane, which does present a certain amount of material. Um, at the moment, that's a reasonably conservative estimate of how much material this end plate would actually introduce. But you see, for the barrel part, it is between 10 to 15 percent of radiation lengths, which would cover actually silicon plus TPC. Um, this spike here in the material is not so dramatic, it's not so bad because it is very close to the end cup of the ECAL. And so if you have actually conversions in there, they don't have enough space to open up and confuse your particle flow very much. So it is, of course, would be nice to be able to reduce it, but it's much less worse than it looks. As if, if, if it would be distributed uniformly or further away from the ECAL end cup, it would have a much larger impact on the final performance of the, of the detector. Me, what, what is the driving, uh, reasons, the driving reasons for the, uh, getting 100 micron or below resolution in the TPC? Is the background rejection or is there any physics uh, measurements? It is, well, the, the, the driving reason for the, for, the, for the tracker is to obtain uh, momentum resolution, which is a few times 10 to the minus 5 for the combined system, combined silicon plus TPC. Yeah, but why? Is it driven by physics? This is driven by physics by primarily, which, by, which by, by the Higgs recall measurement, basically. You want to be able to really measure the Higgs recall precisely enough. I mean, you don't really need that precision, but okay. I'm surprised. Let's continue. This, please, go ahead. Um, this is a plot here of the, uh, of, of the um, anticipated momentum resolution as a function of the momentum for the SID, for, for, for the ILD system at the solid line and for the SID system. And um, I'm showing this plot because it does show you one difference between a silicon-based system and a TPC-based system. Um, how important is it? It's a different discussion, but um, because the material in the, in the silicon-based system is more distributed, you'll find that for low momenta, it is harder for a pure silicon system to really uh, reach excellent accuracy. You gain somewhat with a TPC-based system there for momenta in the sort of 1 to 10 GeV range, which is, of course, for the ILC, a quite important range because a lot of the physics is actually happening at this level for the, for the individual tracks. Here you see uh, an efficiency plot versus the momentum, which you ob obtain. So you see we are very, very close to 100% efficiency. And um, what I'm showing this particular plot because it illustrates quite nicely progress which has been made over the last couple of, basically the last year or so, by including this mini vector information from the vertex detector. So this plot here, this curve here shows you the efficiency which we expected um, Without utilizing this mini vector information, if we include this into our tracking algorithms, we can really gain significantly on this low momentum range and really reconstruct those guys much better than we could before. 
This is for three and a half Tesla. Two, sorry? Three and a half Tesla. Three and a half three, Tesla. 3.5, 3.5 Tesla. Right. Um, of course, the overall detector is very much designed under the paradigm of particle flow. Um, and again, I'm not gonna discuss in any great detail what this means. I presume that all of you are familiar with this. One driving force, of course, is WZ separation, and that is a plot which is shown very often illustrating how well you actually can separate Ws and Vs if you have particle flow at the level of a few percent um, <coughs> as we anticipate for the ILC. And just um, to, to show you what this means, these are plots, for example, by, by CMS, how, they, how well they would be able to do in this quantity. And you see that what, what we intend to do at these detectors is really a very significant progress compared to existing systems. And I presume that is very similar for the FCC detector. Um, particle flow, of course, means that you try to separate your particles as much as you can, also in the hadronic final state, in the calorimeters. And obviously, at some point, this will be, this is, of course, drives the granularity of your detector, and in particular of the calorimeter. But at some point, at some energy, at, at a certain energy, you start to run into trouble because particles start to overlap. And that is a little bit summarized here, where as a function of the jet energy, you'll see how the different contributions to particle flow, which, which role they play, intrinsic performance or confusion. This is a confusion term, which, as expected, rises with energy. And you can see that at large energy, you're basically dominated by the confusion, while at low energies, um, you're essentially driven by the intrinsic resolution of your system. In either case, though, you gain, if you compare it to this curve, for example, which is the sort of naive expectation of it, traditional approach on calorimetry, it's always worse than what you could, could obtain, or nearly always worse, <laughs> what you could obtain with a particle flow-based calorimeter. Um, <clears throat> but of course, as I said, particle flow does mean that you really push on the granularity of your detector, and a lot of studies went into trying to understand what is the optimal separation, what is the optimal configuration of a particle flow calorimeter, and these are just two plots which show you the cell size in the, in the ECAL or the number of layers in the ECAL and how this depends, how this drives the performance of particle flow. So here you see, and the different curves correspond to different jet energies, 45 GeV to 250 GeV, and you see that in general, there is a clear dependence. You see that if you in improve your resolution and thus are able to better separate your particles, you improve your particle flow resolution. Um, <coughs> There might be indications that things flatten out at, at low granularity, but um, that is actually a very complicated study because obviously if you go to these extreme granularities, also your algorithms start to play a very, very important role. And so it is not clear if what you see here is really physics or is really an artifact of the algorithm and the, the judge from that is still out and there are still studies ongoing to really understand what's happening. The dependence on the number of layers actually is surprisingly weak. It is strong at, at 45 GV, obviously, because um, the energy is much less and you really start to see the complete shower, but at higher energies, it is really not so strong, the dependence, if you have 15 layers or 30 layers, um, it doesn't really play such an enormous role. But overall, I think it's clear that uh, you're looking at a calorimeter which has a small cell size, and for ILD, we've chosen for the ECAL a cell size of 5 by 5 square millimeter as a baseline, which is right here. The technical solution we are, we are favoring <coughs> is a silicon-based calorimetry for the ECAL, that is sampling calorimeter with silicon as, an, as, an, as a sensitive material. An alternative scintillator is also being looked at um, but isn't quite as advanced yet as, as a silicon option. This is actually give, giving you very good, this is a plot of the linearity of the system and, and the energy resolution at the end. It is giving you quite good performance and in resolution term of something like 16 to 18 percent. Um, but as a, as it comes as a cost, namely cost, it is quite expensive. And if you look here at the breakdown of the anticipated costs of the detectors, don't worry about the scale, clearly this is uh, among the most important and most expensive items the detector will have, <laughs> silicon-based ECAL. The other one is, interestingly enough, the yoke, the iron. And this is, to some extent, 
driven by the push-pull requirement or by, by the requirement that you'd like to be able to access the, the cavern while the detector is, while the magnet is on, which puts a limit on the stray field and which just essentially forces you to put a lot of iron around to, to control the magnetic field. Microphone, please. <laughs> Question was how often you want to push and pull the detector. Right. So the, uh, that is a discussion which, is, which hasn't converged. The, the general idea is that, well, an important input is that we are designing a system such that it can push and pull in roughly a day. So you can exchange one detector to the other with a downtime of roughly one day, which is, of course, pretty ambitious, but can be done. And then it is really up to, I think, if, if that can be achieved, it is then really a matter of how to best optimize the output from the detectors and how to best share then the luminosity so that one system doesn't get too much of an advantage over the other, um, how often you, you push and pull. The fact that you have, of course, then to, you have to have a survey system in place that uh, surveys the detector when, it, when it's pushed and pulled mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to a very good precision has an impact on the systematics of any measurement you're going to do with these detectors. And uh, I wonder if this has been evaluated against the advantage on improving <coughs> the overall systematics. I mean, having different systematics for different detectors, but having more systematics because you have two detectors. Right. There is no clear uh, true or false to this question, which one is better, which one is worse. Both have their advantages. We think we can um, design a system such that it quite rapidly we can recalibrate the systems and con can control the calibration to the required level after push-pull operation. But of course, in, in, in the end, I mean, it remains to be seen. In the end, you only know once you have the system sitting there. Um, but we, we think from a, from a conceptual point of view, this is possible. And we have sort of looked at things like vibrations, et cetera, et cetera, quite intensely. And also continue to do that to convince ourselves that it can be done. It has obviously an impact on the design of the detector. That's clear. You have to design it much more in view of minimizing these type of effects than if you wouldn't have this quite frequent push-pull. Um, but Again, the impact isn't as, la isn't as large as you, might want to, as, as you might think. So in terms of eventual costs, it is not such a big issue. What we have decided to do is, in the conceptual design of a site, is to put both detectors on platforms. These are quite massive concrete structures uh, which move as a whole. Platforms actually quite similar to the one CMS used uh, to move their detector. Um, so technically, this can be done. And this, of course, alleviates many of the problems because it basically moves something as one piece with a very stable system, so right? The cost of the yoke is not only driven by the detector. The cost of the yoke is not only driven by the detector, but also by the requirement for the push-pull. Yes? To some extent, yeah. Okay, let's, let's move this to the discussion session, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Right. Um, for the h cal, of course, as you move out, the h cal obviously also has to be a very granular system, though to a somewhat lesser extent. Ideally, probably also would want to have a silicon-based system for the h cal, but obviously at some point you're really running out of money and you can't afford it. So we're looking at cheaper alternatives, and the current baseline would be um, to use um, a scintillator-based h cal, or I show you in a second in gas RPC-based system um, with a typical cell size of a couple of square centimeters. So three by three or so square centimeters would be typical size of one of those little tiles. Each one is read individually by, by silicon PM, technology which actually makes this type of approach only possible. If you wouldn't have those, I think it wouldn't work. And um, overall, in, 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 over, over the last couple of years, it has been shown that this approach, both silicon and scintillator can work, and there have been extensive test stream studies to evaluate the performance and also the mechanical design to some extent of these systems, uh, which convinced us that it doesn't make sense to propose these systems for such big detectors. The alternative to the, to the scintillator would be in a digital or semi-digital approach, where you try to really have much smaller segmentation also in the hadronic calorimeter, but don't record the amplitude, only record if you haven't hit or not. And then basically, 
by looking at head densities, you try to recover the energy. Um, and again, conceptually, this can work. This shows you that you do get a linear energy response over quite some range. Um, and also, technically, prototypes have shown that uh, one can probably build such systems. But uh, what, in the end, is actually the best um, system so is, some, is a matter of discussion and hasn't been decided. Um, and I'm doing with time, should probably... Have more? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, of course, for the H call, we've tried to really understand if the parameters we're looking at are optimal. And um, although it has been done with less detail than for the, um, for, for, for the E call, we think that uh, something like 3 by 3 square centimeter, 4 by 4, 2 by 2, is probably adequate and you are not gaining a lot if you go to significantly smaller performances. Let me just briefly comment on the very forward regions, and it was also discussed here. Um, also, measurement of the luminosity is, of course, a key issue for the ILC, and uh, we have actually put a lot of effort into understanding and designing the forward region for the ILC or for the ILD in particular. It's a fairly complex system, which has been designed quite carefully with a Lumical, with a very forward, what we call beam call type of calorimeter, and then, of course, an interface between the ECAL and the LUMICAL, which we call LH call. Again, a key issue for us was to really make sure that we push this whole system out of the acceptance of the detector, so that the face of the detector actually is behind the face of the end cup, so that if you have any particles hitting, and because of beam strolling, we have quite a few, hitting the face of the system, you minimize backscatter from this surface into your detector. We used to start with a design very similar to the FCC 10 years ago, so we actually had an L-star, which was significantly smaller, and then we had the Lumical sort of halfway inside the TPC, and this was just a total disaster in terms of performance. We needed to then put huge tungsten shields in here, which just completely screwed up acceptance and, uh, and background occupancies and what have you. So that's something where I think by the way, cooperation between FCC and an IRC would be extremely useful, and I guess both sides could profit there from really working together and understanding what the pros and cons are. I mentioned briefly that powering is, of course, an issue for us, and uh, we have the advantage of this pulse operation with the long inter-pulse inter times, which means we can use power pulsing. We can switch off our detector in, in these quiet times, or at least partially switch it off, and thus gain an advantage on the power which is somewhere between a factor of 10 and 50 on the total power, average power consumption. And quite intense R&D is ongoing to try to understand how one would do that, and also, of course, try to understand how one then cools away the remaining heat without introducing, for example, liquid coolant or stuff like that. All of this, of course, has to happen for a complete detector, so we need to integrate this into a full detector. And we've gone through a number of preliminary studies to see how it all works and convince ourselves that we don't build a beautiful detector and then completely destroy it by having uh, lots of cables and cooling and what have you. And concepts exist, which uh, are also actually implemented in our simulation to study the impact this has on the physics performance and on the, uh, on the overall performance of the system. <clears throat> this brings me to uh, another point, let me software, which is to some extent, of course, different, but highly related. I think it's very important that for these type of studies, one has good software systems and can really look at these different things. Uh, it's also important, I think, that one can do it not just with fast simulation, but also with full simulation. And in the ILC, we tried from, from quite early on, try to use a system which is based on common software between the different groups who are, who are working on this issue. So we came up with a system where we have a common event data format, which is shared between ILD, SID, and the R&D groups, um, LCAO, which talks to the different parts, and also a language to actually describe our detector, which um, <coughs> in the future will be DD4HEP, which, which defines the geometry, the materials, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with the goal of making it easy for people to exchange information, but also to just easily change a detector and study what the impacts possibly are. And it's just a comment on DD4 app. Let me just point out how important that is to really look in detail at the simulations. Um, this, for example, shows you how the mean energy recovered in the ECAL depends on the detailed design of the silicon sensor. It has guard rings between the different cells, and depending on the size of the guard ring, you actually do see quite significant 
impact on the recovered energy, which you have to, which in the end also will have an impact on your final performance, which you need to understand and, um, <coughs> and optimize. A last word on structures, how are we organized? Of course, there's the LD concept group, <coughs> which I mentioned initially, but orthogonal to this, and a lot of work is actually happening not in the concept group, but is happening in so-called R&D collaborations, which address the technical questions. And they do this independent of the detector concept, so independently if it's ILD or SID. P groups like Kali's, LCTPC, FCAL are just examples of those. And this, I think, turned out to be a very powerful approach because it allows people to really sort of also get funding for specific technical questions, which it sometimes might be easier than to get funding for a future project like ILC or, F or FCC or others. And uh, overall, we try to really make sure that even though we have this different groups and, and structures, we maintain a common basis through common tools and you know, continue to be able to exchange information and, uh, and details. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, of course, detector studies for ILC have been ongoing for quite some time. They have re resulted in integrated detector concepts, which uh, try to be as realistic as possible, uh, with fairly detailed models. They are based on a very close cooperation between R&D groups and detector con concept groups. <coughs> and uh, for the future, well, what we really have to improve apart from continuous improvement of the technology is uh, integration, overall engineering concepts, and getting even closer to realism than we currently are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This so you said that uh, an interaction region a la FCC was a disaster. Can you elaborate a bit for the ILC? This? For the ILC. <laughs> now we, so um, so we used to have. I mean, if I understand things correctly, for the FCC, the current situation you have there is sort of similar to if we would be moving our luminometer somewhere here, with an with an L star of 1.5 meters or whatever the final number were, two meters. Um, which is close to actually how we started out for the ILC as well. Um, the trouble we found is that, but this is something which is really pos potentially ILC specific. I just don't know how much of it applies to the FCC. Because in particular of beam straddling, we have lots of background particles which hits the face of your forward calorimeters. Um, and they just backscatter. They produce secondary particles with backscatter into volume. So you see large effect on the occupancy, for example, <coughs> of your calorimeter, but also of the occupancy of the, of the vertex detector. And the closer you are, the bigger it is. And secondly, you see, because of the grazing incidence of particles, you see a lot of occupancy in the, in the end caps of the ECAL, if you have something sort of as solid as a an, as an tungsten calorimeter sitting, say, a meter or a meter and a half in front of the ECAL. So this is what, at the end, drove them the, um, the ILC to really redesign the IP to a much larger L star against a lot of resistance from the machine but in terms of performance, it was just a much better solution. If that applies to the FCC, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I was very surprised when I found yesterday night, and I had it also in my talk, that actually the SID detector plans to have the luminosity calorimeter very close, what you call inside the detector. No, 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 they don't. Well, they're it's at one, one meter and 55. But they're just smaller. Also, the ECAL is, is, con is, is at one meter 55. Okay. But this they can do because they have a six Tesla field. Okay. This is really okay. strongly driven by the field. Okay. Thank you. So they are using exactly the same reasoning. They're just overall smaller. Okay. So we should build a small detector as well? Maybe. <laughs> no, it has to be optimized, I think. It's, uh, uh, I wanted to change subject a little bit. I think you haven't almost mentioned, or I missed it, anything about the readout of the detector yes. and uh, data acquisition in general yes, and yes, the needs yes. in terms of uh, online computing. Uh, I think but, that's probably interesting to hear. Right. This I didn't touch upon at all. Compared to LHC, it's all fairly relaxed. I mean, if you look at the data sizes, et cetera, et cetera, 
they are big, but they are not large by LHG standards. So it is something which certainly 10 years from now, if, or 15 years whenever we're going to build these detectors, will not be a problem at all, which even today probably can easily handle with existing technology. Uh, the most difficult part in terms of reload speed is probably the vertex detector, which you want to really ideally like to be able to read out for every bunch, which for a pixel detector might be a challenge because the readout speed just needs to be very high. Um, but um, overall, it is considered a problem which can be solved quite easily. Two questions. The first one is concerned the TPC and actually these layers of uh, uh, silicon that are integrated uh, in the TPC. So I, well, sort of. So first, I, I do not really understand what is the difference uh, of, between uh, the internal layer of silicon with the TPC and the last layer of the vertex. And uh, for what concerns the external layer, uh, why is not this integrated in a sort of a pre-shower since uh, you use uh, silicon as calorimetry? Could well be that this is the way to go. Um, so here, of course, the, the transition from vertex to what we call SIT is somewhat gray zone. At the moment, it is technology. The vertex is pixel, this one is strips. But of course, you may also want to make the SIT as pixels, if you can afford it. Um, for the outer part, yes, you're right. We're also looking at ways to integrate this as a first layer into the calorimeter. There, the challenge might be alignment. You have to control the alignment of this guy to something like 10 micron or so. And the ECAL typically has an alignment scale which is significantly more relaxed. So uh, it's not obvious that you can actually build something where you would be able to control the SET alignment to 10 micron attached to something which is more like a half a millimeter or so. Good, good explanation, thank you. And the second question concerns the calibration. With so many channels uh, on the ECAL and uh, HCAL, um, one word on the calibration, and why the calibration does not play a role uh, in choosing between analog and digital option for the HCAL? Um. So one of the advantages of the silicon-based ECAL is that it's actually extremely stable. And uh, the claim is that um, the, the, the um, requirements on calibration are somewhat relaxed compared to other technologies. Still, of course, you have to calibrate this, and in particular, you have to also understand where it sits, et cetera, et cetera. But this, we think, mostly can be done with data. For the hadronic calorimeter, yes, indeed, it's a discussion also input into the decision, eventual decision between analog and digital or semi-digital will also be the calibration issue. Clearly, the analog one does need a bit more calibration. On the other hand, also the silicon, you have to, uh, also the, the digital one, you have to understand very well because you need to really understand where's your threshold. Um, otherwise, suddenly areas of the, of the digital one start to light up, etc. if you have noise, if you have uh, coherent effects happening. So it is not entirely obvious um, that also the, that the digital isn't independent of any calibration. For the analog one, we, for, we foresee a system of, of pulsing diodes for every channel, which you can use as a first level uh, um, calibration. And you have a big plus for the silicon PMs that you can actually, they're sensitive to a single photon, so you can really calibrate intrinsically your response through the single photon counting. But it is definitely an issue, absolutely. These two quick questions. Uh, ion backflow, are you depend what, what is the dominant part? Are you dependent, uh, is the beam strahlung, are those uh, more electric? Yeah. yeah, so certainly beam strahlung does play a role in the ion backflow. Um, what we currently plan, we think that we can, um, <clears throat> well, no, let me put two, two things. First of all, we intend to read out the TPC with something like micropattern gas detectors, which have an intrinsic suppression of the ion backflow of an order of 100 or 1,000. This puts us into a regime where throughout a train we can live with the ion backflow. We can control it well enough. In between trains, we probably will have to have a gate or something to remove um, the charge to drift into the complete volume. But we believe we can control it well enough that it doesn't limit the resolution. Second, uh, you have shown the dependence of the resolution in the calorimeter on the, the design of the calorimeter. Uh, 
have you done studies on the dependence on the material budget that you have in front of it? In front of the colorimeter, yes, we have. Yeah. And in particular, in the forward region, we have studied this quite carefully, obviously, with the TPC introducing significant amount of material. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as the material is really within, say, 20, 30 doesn't centimeters, matter. so it doesn't really matter. We don't see a strong effect. If it is, it is different if you put something here, for example, or here, yes. you do see a large effect on the energy resolution. Okay, thank you. So, I don't see other ends, so let's think, uh, thank uh, this again.